Thank you very much. You're all more awake than I am. So <clears throat> thank you for that nice warm applause. I've got a great youth at my table. They're pepping, pepping me up and waking me up. Thank you, for Morton, for all you've done over the past years and helped me in my campaign. <clears throat> and uh, a lot of people laid the, the foundation for that. Jamie Radke down in our area, Ken Cuccinelli. The grassroots had been working Virginia you know, for five to ten years. And so when I ran, that was already in place, all the, all the work Morton had been doing for just years and years and years. <clears throat> and so I, I didn't really train uh, anybody in. It was the most, you know, I'm a free market guy. And it was the most spontaneous uh, action I've ever seen, just emerge. I, people were just making up signs and painting yellow signs with yellow paint in their backyard and putting chalk on their cars. And I mean, it, it was something. I, I just couldn't believe the energy we, we did have. Uh, but today, I think I'll just kind of give you some short remarks on uh, the process and then the product. And the DC press, it, it, is not interested in the product at all. And I'll get to what that is, right? So we got, the, I'm, I'm, I'm in the House Freedom Caucus, right? There's about 40 or plus of us folks, and then there's some other folks in other groups that are, <clears throat> yeah, and they're good. They're, they're taking a lot of heat in the press uh, this week over the uh, speaker vote and all that kind of thing. But uh, the, the press has not given them any uh, reporting, or factual coverage of what they accomplished uh, since last year. If you would have said a year ago they were going to have a new speaker who promised to work from the, the bottom up and get back to regular order, and that, that's the process stuff I'm talking about, right? Regular order, steering committee, make sure you got way better representation of conservatives and uh, younger folks on the committees. And then regular order just basically means a law has to go through, uh, through the committee process and then it can't be hijacked at the end by leadership. And so there's no better example of that than the budget, right? The budget itself, the $3.5 trillion document. I'm on the budget committee and uh, we were done with our work four or five months ago. And then uh, the budget goes from the budget committee through appropriations, 12 appropriations bills. The House passed five, the Senate passed one, and that was the end of that. And then after that, uh, who's in charge of the U.S. budget? And the press came up to me a month ago, <clears throat> and they're all on the Planned Parenthood, right, of the controversial videos and all that. So they come up and say, well, you're going to shut down the government. You're going to shut down the government over Planned Parenthood, aren't you? And that was the question, right? These are very insightful questions. <laughs> and so I just look at them with a blur, and I'd go, well, I said, I'll answer your question if you answer my question. I said, can you tell me, since you're asking a question about the budget and shutdown, can you tell me who's in charge of the United States budget right now? And they go, no, who is in charge of the budget? I said, well, you're an investigative reporter, aren't you? I said, so maybe you should go find that out. I said, because I don't know who's in charge of the budget right now. And I'm on the United States Budget Committee. So I find that fascinating, and perhaps there's a story in there for you, right? Because I'm on the budget committee, and I don't know what's going on with the budget. And I was, this is truthful, but tongue-in-cheek at the same time, right? And they're just stunned. And so then I didn't have to answer the question about Planned Parenthood, so I was, <laughs> that's all they want, right? They just go for these little nuggets to, to ding you. But that's the serious question, right? And so we knew Barbara Mikulski was in that room. Right? She wanted to break the cap, so the Democrats are in the room somehow. And then the final agreement was between Harry Reid and, and Nancy Pelosi and, and the three, and Obama, and then McConnell and, uh, and Boehner. So they had three to two uh, when we owned the budget and we owned the House and the Senate. And we lost. We gave them everything they wanted. And that included the debt ceiling increase, et cetera, and about $80 billion addition to the deficit, uh, the military stuff was okay, but even there on the budget committee, we, we were finished with the budget document. The defense guys hadn't come to us at all. They came to us the day that we finished the budget. And uh, so that's, that's the process stuff I'm, I'm trying to get at. But uh, I'll just go back and give you a quick little overview since I, I've been in one year now. I came in early, Eric stepped down a month or two early. So I came in last November on the, and here comes the process stuff. This is 
kind of new. I came in on the cromnibus that funded Obama's unconstitutional amnesty. Right? So that was my opening week. And everybody up here is very gracious to me. I was shocked. Right? I thought there was going to be some bad blood or whatever. Everyone, very nice. Uh, the senior guys uh, said just two things. Dave, whatever you do, don't vote against a rule and don't vote last. They were trying to give me good advice. And that was pretty good advice. Some people go their whole career and they haven't voted against a rule. So what I just gave you is called foreshadowing. Anybody go to Hamp Sydney here? I usually bug Hamp Sydney students. Or nobody know him. So it's called for So if they tell you, don't vote last and don't vote against a rule. Can you see why I'm saying this? <laughs> so we have a rule vote on the budget of the United States called the Cromnibus, right? So it's a CR, a continuing resolution, CR, plus an omnibus. So we, they jam that together, 1,700 page document. Uh, my first week there, two days to read it. Not three, that's promised, right, by our own. Republican Boehner rule and that kind of thing. So two days to read 1,700 pages. And uh, we get on the floor to vote for the rule. And the rule is, you know, the rule allows the bill to come to the floor in a certain form with certain amendments. And you know, so you don't have an infinite number of amendments. And this matters because this is what is, we're doing this week. Paul Ryan, to his great credit, is opening up the process this week for real. And we'll get to that. Uh, but on the rule... Uh, the rule included some policy stuff, so it was easier to vote against. They're not supposed to include any policy. It's just supposed to be methodology and that kind of thing. And so I'm just fascinated with all this my first week. And I'm you, right? Prior to this, I was a professor reading books for a living. And then you're sitting there voting the next week. And so imagine yourself. Boehner comes down on the floor, and McCarthy and Scalise, the whips, everyone. And they're, they never come on the floor. So when they come on the floor, oh, there's energy. And they're yelling at people, making deals. And so I'm going, wow, this is interesting, right? I'm, this is true education. And you see real politics. And so you see what's going on. I looked up at the board. It's about 212, 212, something like that. And I hadn't voted. It was about dead even. <laughs> so if you've all seen the Lord of the Rings, is that the right? Lord of the Rings, right? The Eye of Sauron, right, was there. So I put in the vote card, voted no, and there goes the whole budget for the U.S. down. <laughs> right. Except the gavel didn't come down. Right? So there's another, another new trick I learned. So the gavel never comes down. And so they went and talked to Stutzman from Indiana. Good Christian guy. I say the problem up here is too, we got too many good Christians, right? They, <laughs> The Christians all believe people when they tell them stuff. <laughs> and they're innocent, they're good. So he was promised on that bill, we'll, we'll get this right procedurally, we'll, we'll get it, right? They didn't promise him a bridge, nothing like that. It was on process, good for the country. Promised him and a couple other guys, and it's all written up in Politico or whatever, so it's all summarized. And so Stutzman and a couple other guys change their votes, and it goes to a yes. <clears throat> and that's the way it works, right? So just day after day after day. And so that's the budget. I've covered a little on that. And then we went, you know, tough vote after tough vote after tough vote. The trade thing comes up. The Iran deal was horrendous. You had to go down in a bunker. Right to read the deal that your constituents couldn't read, and you represent your constituents, and you have to vote on that. That was a terrible uh, deal. It was uh, I voted. I was one of the few who voted against that. Corker Cardin. That was the yeah. And then anytime you're effective, right? I can tell when I'm effective because Politifact writes something on me the next day. So on that one, I said. I guess I phrased it. I said I was one of the few who voted against the Iran deal. And they said false, totally false. And they said, well, the Iran deal is the whole thing. I said, it's not, it's not just cork or carton, right? And so I said, but I said voted. I voted. I was one of the few who voted. That this is the only vote that we took on Iran, right? So it's the only, and they, no, no, we don't. We think of it differently than you do, so it's false, 
right? And you just cannot believe what it's like, what the press does to you. I was just sharing a couple stories on the New York Times, did a thing on me yesterday in New York Magazine. And you just go through it. And two weeks ago, I was on Meet the Press. Anybody see that one? So that one, I did okay. They said I was a little over-caffeinated on that. I was, I was excitable in that one. So if you want to go... You can go to my Facebook, DaveBratt.com, and I got a, a nice, boring 30-minute thing on, on the budget. If you have a hard time sleeping, you'll like that one. But two weeks ago, Meet the Press, that was a good one. So that one, I said something about uh, Charlie Dent. What did I say? Uh, I said he was trying to kick us off of, out of our own conference, right? And, they, and Charlie said, well, that's not true. I said, well, Charlie, you, you just said it last week in conference. And so PolitiFact, again, comes at me the next day, and they say, uh, prove it. So we sent them five links. We sent them like 10 minutes late. They gave us three hours to do it on a Sunday afternoon, right, just for start. Just that's how it works. So we sent those in. They ignore it, basically. And then, this is, you will not believe this, they changed the transcript from the Meet the Press show. When they rewrote the transcript, and they had me swearing at Charlie, uh, Charlie Dent, they changed, just created words out of whole cloth and had me swearing at the guy I'm on a TV show with. Right, and that's PolitiFact, who's supposed to be the ethical arbiter of the debate up there. Right, so there's just a little on the press. So you got the process, and then you got the press. And then I'm an economist, and so all of this matters, right? The only thing the press is interested in is this horse race stories. Right? They'll come up and say, what do you think of this? And I'll say, well, it doesn't change the deficit, doesn't change the debt, and whatever, and say, this is so, oh, so you differ with Paul Ryan on that. And they're looking for that, right? And so all of this so far has been process. And Paul Ryan, we're going to make some good moves on process right now. We're in the middle of it on this transportation package. It showed up in a bad form. But just keep your eye on the ball, and as conservatives, help – me message, help everyone message. So far, nothing has changed for the American people, right? So you can talk about this horse race and you can talk about the process and regular order. That's going to help us. But keep your eye on the numbers, right? I mean, we just passed a horrendous budget deal. We just increased the debt ceiling. That was our leverage for just a multitude of changes we wanted. We gave it away for a year and a half. Right, so the debt ceiling increase goes for about a year and a half, gave up all of our leverage on anything else we wanted to do. We increased the deficit instead of reducing it in order to clear the path for the new speaker. Right, so they could show up with a clean barn, is what the, that's what the saying was. Right, so you make things so bad, you add to the debt, you add to the deficit, you add to all this stuff, clog the arteries of the economy in order so that now we can say, well, now we're going to do good stuff, right? And so it's just the American people just are not seeing anything that's improving their lives coming out of our side. We own the House. We own the Senate. And they're not seeing it on foreign policy. What's, uh, what's the Republican message on foreign policy? Anybody? Nothing. Right, right. So we, we, there's no message you can name. So there you have it. On business, what's our message? <clears throat> right? And you can't, if you can't articulate, right, we spend gazillions of dollars up there. <clears throat> Kathy McMorris Rogers in, in, in charge of messaging, whatever. So they have access to all sorts of talent. And no one knows our message. And so all of you, I mean, help us do that, right? Help us write. All of you are very active. How many people here from Virginia? Oh, good. That's good. Okay, good. So, and congratulations on all, of, all the work I'm sure you all put in for yesterday's great result, right? We, that was just hugely important. You lose the Senate and all sorts of new tricks are going to come into play. So thank you for all the work you've done on that. But keep going. It right into the newspapers and help message, right? Just pointed stuff. We, it's, it's, we've given up on Obamacare almost altogether. Everybody, by the day, right, is now paying higher taxes in a multitude of ways. 
the fees, the deductibles are it it's killing business. And it's like we've just given up. Like, okay, Obama's here to stay. And I don't think it is. I think it's gonna implode. And so it's but you need to help it implode because the narrative you have to change the narrative. And so right into the newspapers. I encourage everybody go out. I'd love to have you all on my uh, email account, right? Come out to my uh, Facebook, DaveBrat.com, and sign up for my newsletter because then I know who, who I have out there following. And I try to explain every vote, and I try to explain every major policy that's coming up. And so I'll just end on, and I'm happy to take any questions, <clears throat> on what's going on right now in the transportation bill and, and Paul Ryan and the credibility He's coming in saying uh, <clears throat> we're going to do things right. It's going to be bottom up, and it's going to be regular order, which means it's going to go through committees. <clears throat> and I think he's actually going to do it because <clears throat> he gave up his future shot at the presidency, et cetera, uh, to get something done. What he, he wants to get his big ways and means packaged through now as speaker. And that would be a good thing, right, because that will be entitlement reform and – <clears throat> a whole new way of budgeting. And so I think that's really what he wants to accomplish. And that would be the good piece if we get that part through. I know the immigration and all that, you've got <clears throat> reservations and so do I. <clears throat> but he's going to use regular order as a vehicle to, to get some of this through and to keep some of us from blocking. Right? The Freedom Caucus has 40 to 50. We can block in our own house. And I'll just... I'll give you the basics on that, too. Sometimes you forget the basics of, of politics. But at any time, Boehner could have come over to here, to the right, to the conservatives, and passed anything, right? We have a majority in the House. So you can pass any bill you want by coming over to us 50. So why wouldn't they do that? Who's got the answer? What's up here at high noon in the middle where they went to get the votes with the Democrats, right? They did that three or four times on major, major bills. What's up here at high noon <clears throat> that's not down here uh, if you go over to the uh, right and the conservatives to win your vote? You can win the vote either way. What? The press, the pre right, the press is good. Money. That, uh, money, right? So it's always just follow the money, right? So we're overcommitted. We've made promises to every constituency under the sun. And some of them are good, right? Some of them are bad. But roads, transportation, right? We got a bill, transportation bill. It's probably not going to be paid for today, right? And they attached Export Import Bank to it, by the way, just for kicks. And so we make huge promises to all sorts of constituencies, and we can't pay over here. If you go with the conservatives, then you lose K Street. But if you go over here with Pelosi, it's one major party up in D.C., right? It's the party of money. And that explains, you just go back and review, right, where they went to get the Democrat votes, and you just follow the money, and that's usually the logic, and it's usually about that simple. So I'll end right there on the process and the product, and happy to take any. Yep, and let's do real quick questions, and I'll try to get to as many people as I can. Yep. And I got to get back supposedly for a nine o'clock conference meeting. I'm sure I'm going to be late, but whatever. It's a joy for you for uh, you to be here, Congressman um, Brett. Thank you. My name is Quinn. I w yep. With all the status quo mentality of the D.C. establishments, uh, acting more like political schizophrenia, you know, as each uh, election, you know, come and go. Mm -hmm. um, why hasn't there been more enough done uh, with uh, folks on the budget committee in terms of? you know, addressing and taking this trillion dollar deficit that we have as a nation yep. under control and, and yet this administration continues to cripple down this economy right now. What, what can you uh, aspire this next wave of leadership to do? Thank you very much. Yeah. So uh, kind of basic question, why, why doesn't the budget committee ever cut anything? And it's the same kind of answer. There's always kind of another election around the corner always, right? So we're kind of scared of our own shadow, right? We're scared of this group and this group and this group. And so you got to fund everything to keep everybody happy. And if you keep doing that, uh, you make every group happy, but the country as a whole gets on the wrong track. 
And so our, on the budget committee itself, we actually passed a budget this year that, that balances in 10 years. So that's not ideal. <clears throat> and you all may not know, but it, it, on the budget track we're on and in law right now, I didn't even get to the big numbers, but the, we're, according to CBO, we're going to have trillion-dollar budgets again, tr trillion-dollar deficits by 2025. So they came down, right? They used to be 1.4 trillion after 07, 08, after the financial crisis. Now they're down to only 450 billion. They say that with a straight face, by the way. The head of CBO, they're, they're only 450 billion dollars, half a trillion dollars. But they're going back up from like today, over the next nine years, by 2025, they're at a trillion. And so your question's on the mark, what are we gonna do? And, and, even the most serious hawks, we don't hold our own line, right, and just tell the chairman no on no votes. And just to put a little, the, the unfunded liabilities I ran on, it used to be $127 trillion. Now it's $100 trillion if you got to the debt clock, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, all that kind of stuff. All federal revenues in 11 years, and then this is CBO, you can go to CBO graph, the main graph, <clears throat> all federal revenues in 11 years will only go to those entitlement programs and interest on the debt. In 11 years, there won't be $1 left for the military, education, transportation, all the running government. So that's a fact. And I'm on the budget committee. We can't change any of that. So the, the mandatory spending is two-thirds of the budget right now. It's going to be 100% in 11 years. Budget committee cannot change that. That's in law, right? So those programs... You have to go through the House, the Senate, and overcome a veto. So the number's already bad enough by itself, but the Budget Committee can't change that two-thirds, and it's going to grow to 100% of all revenues in 11 years. That's for the next generation, right? It, we put the debt on them. Seniors are already going to get clipped 20%, 30% of their benefits in 11 years, guaranteed. That's in law. The Social Security... Uh, disability trust fund went bankrupt this year, 2016. We just fixed that. It's got all sorts of fraud in it, right? I think it went up 400% spike in some categories of usage from fraud. So to fix that, we didn't fix it. We didn't reform the system. We took money from the senior fund for retirees and put it into the corrupt fund. That's the way you fix something. And everybody knows it. Yep, I went way off too long. Yep. barn remind him what's in barns horses asses yeah <laughs> right right Cu couple couple questions with the um changing of the transcript that you said politico did yeah. is that liable is that actionable do you know i don't think so i, I mean, doubt it that's for public what, figures there's nothing they can but it there, probably if i really wanted to spend all my i probably could do something because it seems like yeah. That's what conservatives need to do is to start standing I up know, to media to, them, right. to hold them accountable. PolitiFact, right. PolitiFact is the one who did it. For, for what they do. Yep. Um, yep. Second question, last question is, I understand the integrity of getting back to regular order, but, and, and I, you know, I'm not a politician, so I don't know as much about this, but when, as a Republican, I saw Harry Reid do all the dirty dealings yeah. that he did, yep. I'd like to see my side do that, too. <laughs> right, right. Why can't we? Is it because Obama has the, the power of the veto? I'd like to see Republicans put things on Obama's desk and make him do his damn job yeah. of vetoing if he's going to veto it, then his signature's yeah. on it. Yeah. Uh, how do I answer this diplomatically? <laughs> It, you're not going to see that. I'll put it to you this way. If you wake up in this city and you vote with leadership, you get a million dollars in your bank account. Right? So I don't vote with leadership. So do I have a million dollars in my bank account? So if you have any rich uncles, get on that one too today. Right? I got zip. So that, right? So what I'm trying to say is uh, the left... And politicians like to say no to people or yes to people. Yes, because that helps you get votes. Right? Uh, so our side uh, is 
halfway captured by K Street and the money and the security of either you got to go face your voters straight up with your message and pray you got some active members like I do and pray they stay that way and that the ads or the opponents can't override that. Or you can be comfortable and just kind of go along and get a million or two million in your account. And the most liberal members, by the way, and you can go look, the Patriot program, the NRCC, the, the Patriot program is the 12 most liberal members of the conservative conference, and they get $2 million, right? And some in leadership are trying to take out and run against the conservatives, right? Chamber of Commerce announced they're going to do that, U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Not your state chambers, they're good guys. Not your locals, they're good guys. But the federal has announced they're going to try to take out some of the rabble-rousers who have PhDs in economics <laughs> that are pro-business, and it's just stunning. Why would the Chamber of Commerce want to take out someone who wants to increase GDP growth for the country? Why would that be? I can, and you know the answer. It's terrible. So that's, you, that's a good question. Why doesn't our side do that? Because the momentum up here is always on the upside. It's never on the cut side. So Tell the make a question in the back there. All right. The lady. Hey, morning. Wait for the microphone. Wait for the microphone, please. Hi, Congressman. Morning. Dr. Kelly Ward from Arizona. Great. You're one of my heroes, I will say. Oh, I want to know your biggest piece of advice for insurgent candidates like me who want to shake up Washington, D.C. What, what is the one thing that I can do to uh, get here to help make a difference? To get here, right, for candidate, right. Uh, number one, be like yourself. Go get your credentials in order and, uh, you know, you, and, and then don't overdo it, right? Conservatives tend to get hyper and start... <laughs> drawing pictures of people and calling names and expressing your enthusiasm. But you got to motivate the conservatives, but at the same time, you need 51%, right? So the base will get you about 20%. And so if we're going to win, you have to be excited and fully conservative, but you can't freak people out. So, And that would be my probably the number one piece of advice is uh, you've got to show basically the suburban mom is that 51 percentile. You got to show them that your policies are in their interest, right? That you're going to do what's best for their kid, and you can do that easily on national security, safety grounds, on the economy, on re on real education, on really getting their kid a job. And uh, you got to keep that soccer mom and dad kind of in mind, in, at least in my district. They are, they're kind of your key vote. And so you're, you're going to win the base, right? We've got the message and all that. But then you can't freak people out. And so, you know, get, get people with some business experience, some academic experience or whatever. Know the numbers. Uh, be ready for the press. They'll try to trip you up every five seconds. That's, that's the best I got on a short. Who you got more? I'll let him do the heavy. Your thoughts, please, on the uh, presidential race, the Republican field? No, man. Here you go. I know. <laughs> that's always a killer. I get out of this one by saying, and I was on the lawn right at the Tea Party talk on the con with Donald Trump standing next to me. Right, So we're like this. He's like this. And the press... Geniuses that they are, I said, well, Dave, you're going to endorse, uh, endorse Donald today? And he's standing right there. <laughs> so I went, well, Donald's great. I said, we're both for free markets and, you know, the rule of law. And, he, you know, he's good, and we're both want to make America great again. And then he looks over and he says, he better endorse me or I'll ruin his political career right now. <laughs> I'm like, so that... Thank you for that great question. So my answer to that is I ran on the Republican creed of Virginia, and I just tell people whoever's closest to that creed, that's who I'm going to vote for. I don't believe in machine politics and telling you who to vote for. So, I mean, that's it. I mean, adherence to the free market system, equal treatment under the law, Constitution. 
And so you can make your guesses as to who the stronger candidates are there that I would probably like. It's a good one, though. Yep. Okay. Hmm. Let, let's uh, take the lady there. Yes. You. This might be in your wheelhouse. I'm Barbara Bowie Whitman. Yep, yep. Uh, I would like to know whether you think that the Trans-Pacific Partnership will come up for a vote before the presidential election and if it will pass. Ooh, that's a good one. <coughs> I would think, I would think the, just the logic and the, the timing, it would come up before then. But it'll, I, I, haven't, I haven't thought through the politics of it from their side or our side, whether they want it to come up. And I'm hearing all sorts of, they're finding all sorts of goodies in there that no one knew was in it. And so it's going to be a, a lightning bolt. And that's, that would be one of those issues on the right and on the left that's not going to energize their bases. It, it energizes K Street and the, and the business community and trade right the the trade folks but it's so i i don't know that's a, it's a good question i would think it would come up before then it, the business community needs it i'm a free trader right i mean i'm for trade but the first thing the first phrase the, the guys that were selling that thing said this is going to give president obama more authority and so i'm like i'm against that trade and so it is it's a tough situation to be in right i'm a free trader but Obama's negotiation and the, the basic planks in that trade agreement had to do with labor law, environmental law. Just, it was all regulatory. Yeah, and, and, and the interesting thing about it was actually some of that stuff, our own side misunderstood. It was actually going to make it be a little good for our side in the sense it was going to make the rest of the world as inefficient as we are. So it's a matter of whether you have that mentality, right, that you want to make the rest of the world as inefficient and impose all of these tremendous costs on the rest of the world. And I, that's not my worldview. I want to bring the barriers down on them and on us. But that, there again, you just see, right? The logic is always just moving in that direction. So I don't, I don't know. That's a good question. I'll check into it because I should know. We'll, we'll take, uh, yeah, I better do one more and I better. One more question. Uh, Jordan Dakin there. Oh, great. <laughs> Do you, uh, I'm guessing you may have used TIAA CREP yep. as your saving device. Yep. And that you did not change that in the least when you got into office. Is that correct? Or? Yeah. No, that's right. Yeah. Education. We had TIAA CREP is huge, it's like a monopoly in education. So that's our portfolio. You can pick, you can mix and, and match where, wherever you want to put your money. So I was fairly boring, but I don't have any money to invest anyway. So it's all right. Any? Do we need to close on anything uplifting? Yeah. <laughs> Go Virginia. Yes. Sunday. Positive. Sunday is your church service. Go and pray. <laughs> There's a little. There you go. Thank you all for letting me have a few words with you. Thank you, Morton.